Oh, we should have played Convoy. That would have been a great uh, segue into this. Um, sorry, Katie. Uh, she had no idea what we're going to be talking about. Breaker Breaker 1-7, I've seen a resurgence in the popularity of CB radios. Ham radio operators are also on the rise. Our guest, John Bignall, is... Are you a ham, John? I am a ham. In the ham community, I'm known as a Victor Echo 1 and Julia Mike Bravo. I, I probably have seen your plate. People may want uh, <laughs> license plates that are specific for ham operators. And uh, yes. th that's not a customized plate, folks. It's not supposed to read anything other than his frequency. Uh, John, th this is something you've been involved with for how long? You know what? I've been uh, active on the airwaves, uh, CB in the 80s, and just recently licensed as a ham operator uh, in here in Halifax. Uh, and in my job as a professional paramedic, I've been using the airwaves for, you know, 25 years easily. But as a ham operator, uh, this is a new world for me. It's an exciting world that I had no idea. When I first took the test and first challenged uh, the exam, I it kind of opened my eyes that, wow, this is a big, big community. And it's kind of in the shadows right now, and I hope to raise a little awareness to it, because it's really an exciting world of amateur radio, and there's so much happening, and I just want to share it with you today. You know, I'm not surprised that uh, there's this resurgence. We all have these devices we can communicate, but something different uh, here when you have a CB radio or a ham radio, you can talk virtually around the world, but it's human voice. It, it's, it's like a phone, but it's not. So. <laughs> yeah, no, it's really amazing, and I think the world has become quite small, and I my son and I, uh, Patrick, we were setting up a radio, and we were trying to connect to a gentleman in Spain. And what was funny is after we got it all working, we made the contact. I had the confirmation. He was able to hear us. Uh, my son looked at me. He's only eight years old now. And he looked at me and said, Dad, it's too bad in uh, France they didn't have, didn't have cell phones. We could just FaceTime this guy. <laughs> so I think the perspective from the youth is that our world is very, very small. But I kind of give the analogy, it's like fishing. You know, we can go to the store and buy a fish, but there's nothing like catching a shad or a trout. Uh, that, that morning, the experience of being out fishing is really part of the adventure and the challenge. And that's, for me, when I look at ham, ham art radio and ham operating, the uh, Canadian National Parks on the Air kind of combines a lot of the things that I really value, and that's the technology side of amateur radio, but also getting out in the, the woods and getting out into our national parks. So what is this campaign? What is Canadian National Parks on the Air? Well, Canadian National Parks on the Air is a, it's a, an organization that was started here in Nova Scotia by some really amazing hams, some real uh, talented people that just said, you know, let's, let's set up a, a program where we can activate a park. And when you say activate, what they want you to do is take your radio into a park, set up, and, and not in an intrusive way, in a very mobile, compact way, set up, and then see how many people you can connect with and talk to. And now me at home, if I'm at home or if I'm in a different country, I then try to chase the activator, and I get a point for finding them and finding them on the airwaves and making that contact, and they get a point for activating. So we each get a point, and at the end of the day, whoever has the most points wins. So it becomes a contest. And right now there's uh, 200 and some odd parks in Canada that are historic sites and national parks, and hams from across the country and, and even from other countries are coming to Canada to activate the parks and make contacts. You know, one of the best things about that, it, it keeps the, the hobby around, it keeps the hobby and, and its uh, participants active. And I know from being involved with emergency services, there are many times that part of this communications network and fail safer backup is the ham operator network. Yeah, no, and that's an interesting uh, analogy when you look at emergency services. When all other things fail, hams are there with their setup, with their go kits, and ready to go. And this really challenges uh, the hams out there, the other amateur operators, to go into a park with a portable operation, with battery power, solar power, uh, a mobile antenna. And we think back to some of the disasters we've had in Nova Scotia, from Swiss Air to uh, other events that occurred. It was hams that brought were brought in and set up on site at Peggy's Cove and were able to connect to all the different agencies, which was kind of a unique scenario, especially in 1998 when the Swiss Air went down. But when you look at uh, just recently on the weekend, there was a tornado in Minnesota, and all the hams got together. They were able to give an update on where the tornado was within their area using a two-meter frequency and then connect to everyone and give them updates of where, where it was headed, where it was going, it's kind of the eyes on the ground. And we have that system here in Nova Scotia. When a storm happens, they activate the network, the, the radio operators get out and kind of give people an update of what's happening in my community compared to what's happening in your community, and then update that with uh, 
the Weather Network. Uh, so if, John, someone's listening and they want to get involved with the hobby, they want to perhaps renew uh, their interest in the hobby, uh, what advice do you have for them? You know what? I think at this point in time you can get a hold of local agencies. There's there's associations right across the province. If you Google uh you know, ham operators in Nova Scotia. There's a great program in Halifax, great program in Dartmouth, and a lot of really cool things are happening. And even if you don't have a license, there's things you can do. One of my kids, they thoroughly enjoy uh, taking a little handheld in their iPhone, and when the International Space Station goes overhead, you can download images from the space station using your handheld and your iPhone, and that's just kind of cool. Who, who gets a message from space? as a satellite travels over uh, over your home. Uh, so it's kind of a fun little activity. Absolutely. And you know Morse code? I am trying to learn Morse code. And <laughs> it's interesting to bring it up because tomorrow is the 175th anniversary of Morse code, what we refer to as continuous wave, CW. And what blew me away when I first got involved, I thought, Morse code, who's using that now? Who's actually using those dots and dashes? But it, it's amazing. You get on the air and people from right across the world are using this because it's such an effective way to communicate. And if you want to connect with a park in Alberta and the bands aren't working very well, you use CW, your Morse code, and you're pretty much guaranteed to make that contact. So it's a very effective way to connect with other uh, parks, other uh, hams, and get your message out there. VE1JMB. We've got uh, John here with us, John Bignall. It doesn't surprise me that a backyard beekeeper who likes honey <laughs> is also a ham. It's all perfect. Yeah, save your dandelions. It's that time of year. Absolutely. Uh, John, thanks for doing this. Glad, glad to have you back on the show. All right. Have a great day, Sheldon. You Thank too. you. Uh, if you'd like to know more about the Canadian National Parks on the Air, it's C-N-P-O-T-A. Hello. Canadian National Parks on the Air uh, dot C-A. Uh, thanks to John. Thanks to Katie Hartai, our producer this afternoon. And uh, Katie, you're producing tomorrow, too. All of the producers tomorrow. All right. Well, uh, get your rest. It's a big day. It's Friday. And uh, all news afternoon coming your way next. We'll have the latest on the announcement of $100 million committed to the cleanup of Boat Harbor. We'll tell you about that all afternoon. Stay tuned, and uh, we'll see you here tomorrow at 1230.